Okay. <clears throat> uh, everybody asked me that question, so, okay, you're allowed. So, the meet came about when I was four days old. About four days, I don't know. I do stand-up comedy from time to time, and I do two routines, uh, How I Got My Name and How I Met Elvis Presley. And that takes up seven minutes, and if it goes longer, I go into the uh, royal family, royal knockout. I know, my third comedy thing. And um, anyway, Sarah Ferguson called me Meaty. Meaty, uh, Meaty, and I called her Flower. Yo, Flower. Now, you're, I'm talking to a royal family member going, yo, Flower. And I told them all, I'm, I'm not playing that game. I'm not playing that game. Your Highness and standing up whenever you walk in a room, I'll be up and down, up and down all day long. Every time we had a team, and if she went away from the team and walked back in to where the team is, we always stand up. No way, dude. So anyway, that's my third bit. The first one is my name. Second is how I'm at Elvis. And that's the longest one. That's, that's probably five minutes because that's a story. And uh, next time, I'll tell you that. Uh, I'll just give you the very beginning. We were doing Rocky Horror Picture Show out in L.A. Rocky Horror Show, not Picture Show, in L.A. I did the, the stage show. And it was a Saturday night, and we had done our 6 o'clock Saturday show, so it ended at 8.30. And dinner time uh, was between 9 and 10. The next show started at 10.30. So we had a two-hour break, and we used to go to the Rainbow Room across the parking lot and eat. Well, as we're going in the Rainbow Room, our heads are down because we we don't know who's going to be in there. We just run the show, but we want to eat and have a special place for us to go. Our heads are down so the people don't. And walking out, I saw a gun in a holster. And I'm going, what? A guy wearing a gun. I looked up, and it was Elvis. And I, I, I went, uh, uh, Elvis is my idol. And the Elvis band came to see me. Some of the Elvis band came to see me once. And they go, you're, you're, you're another Elvis. You're like Elvis. This is in Memphis. We did, they have a pyramid arena. And we did that. And they were, they were going crazy, this band. And how much I was like Elvis. And uh, that was a compliment. Maybe I am sort of like Elvis. Without really meaning to be like, I don't shake my hips and, you know, woo, make the girl scream. I do make the girl scream because I'm a sex god. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to when you were a kid. Right here. Right? And there's uh, Eddie. And I can't see it very well. Anyway, let's play. Hang on. All right, here we go. Whatever happened to Saturday night? Dressed up sharp and you felt all right. It don't seem the same since cosmic light came into my life. I thought it would be fine. I used to go for ride chicken go and listen to the music on our radio. Saxophone was blowing on a rock and roll show. Climbed in the back seat when we really had a good time. Anyway. Uh, it's not bad for, uh, that was recorded uh, 45, 46, 47, 47 years ago. And that's a pretty high key. And I just sing in the same key that I did 47 years ago. Not bad for a young kid, right? Yeah, the first one is this. 
I, uh, we, I did the play, and in the play I played Dr. Scott and Eddie. And in the play, I, as Dr. Scott, I drew on his mustache and his eyebrows and wore this bad gray wig and had fishnet stocking. It was very campy. And, but that's how I learned to really what acting was all about. In rehearsal, Tim said the line, well, doc, uh, well, I said, well, Frank and Ferner, we mean it last. And he goes, yes, Dr. Scott, we mean it last. But he had the first line, and, um, and he said the first line, and the way I was saying, well, Frank and Ferner, we mean it last, I couldn't have said it that way. And it was like, I felt like it was a year, and all of a sudden, that's when I learned about being in the moment. Even though I'd been taught that for years, you've got to stay in the moment, the truth. And the truth is, if we were carrying on a conversation, like Barry and I do, I don't know what he's going to say. And so, as an actor, you have to never know what the other actor is going to say. You don't know. Even though you've read it, you can't remember it. You don't know. Because you have to be in the moment. Because you have to react to what he's saying. It's like when another person carries on a conversation with you. You react to that per whatever that person says. Oh, you're right. Yeah, we should go to the park on Sunday. You wouldn't go, oh, you're right. We should go to the park on Sunday. That's called overacting. <laughs> so that's it. And then the other random thought is this. Uh, I did tell him I should play Dr. Scott. And he goes, and that's about four days in the shooting. They haven't shot Dr. Scott. It's coming up in a couple of days. He goes, no, I think we're right doing this. And after he shot the first couple of scenes with Dr. Scott, he came over to me and he said, I came showed up one day and he goes, you know, you were right about Dr. Scott. I said, I told you so. I said, well, let's do it. And he goes, no, it's too late now. And the guy who played Dr. Scott was the original narrator in the London production. He should have stayed as the narrator because he was a much better narrator and he said so when he saw this guy. And uh, yeah, there's some well-known actor they got, but he wasn't that well-known because everybody's going, who's that guy? They thought he was, but anyway, the, the actor who played the narrator should have played the narrator. I should have played Dr. Scott. That would have maintained the integrity of the piece. And we lost integrity when I didn't play Dr. Scott. Not because I was a better actor, not because of any of that. It's about Dr. Scott being, the, being Eddie's uncle. That's the integrity. It lost that campiness. It lost that, what? He's doing what? He's playing Eddie and Dr. Scott? Come on. But no, it worked. And that's my random thought, other than it was really great being on the set when Susan Sarandon sang Touch It, Touch It, Touch Me in her, her bra and underwear. My youngest daughter kept going, Pearl's your favorite, I'm not. No, it didn't work like that. Pearl was older, and Amanda wanted to do what Pearl did, but... Pearl was five years older than Amanda, so that was a problem. And I've seen it when... Uh, Kids get mad at their mom, and their mom is mad at the kids, and they don't talk to each other. And that happened to me, my father. I didn't talk to him for six years. And then he got ill, and somebody called me, and I went back, talked to him, and it was completely different. So, um, he later passed away, and nobody told me. Can you believe that? I was thinking about that yesterday. How crazy is that? The woman he was dating or going out with because my mother passed away didn't tell me until after they had uh, the funeral. So then I went rushing back and I went out to, you know, his blah, 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 blah. Everything! Well, that's how he was. Everything! You're getting mad, boy, I'm telling you, mad. So I got my temper from him, but I learned to control it early because I had to. If I hadn't learned how to control my temper, I'd be in prison. Yeah, I had to learn. I channeled it into acting, into football, into this now. I channeled that energy. I, I, I used it on stage. 
and use that aggressiveness on stage because I went on that stage really aggressive. Not mad at the audience, but just like, yes, yes, you people, we're gonna rock. You're not gonna stop it, you're gonna rock. And the, the audience that was, the, and it happened every time. We played this arena in Sheffield, England. And it's the weirdest audience. The people there are, they're really great people, but they're weird audience. Because it doesn't matter what show, we once did seven shows in, in uh, uh, seven shows in 13 nights, because I don't do a show every night, and every show was the same thing. You would think they got people, dug them up from grave, and set them in the seats. Because it was like, okay, we paid our money, let's go, do the show. Well, that's that's how I uh, that's how I take it anyway. You paid your money, and I'm going to give you everything I got. They wanted me to do it, so we'd start, and they'd get this applause. Yeah, that's really good. We'd do life as a lemon and go hard, or out of the frying pan, or whatever, and really blast their socks off. And um, they'd sit there, and I turn around the band, and I go, "We're getting these motherfuckers. Let's go." Excuse my language, but that's what it was. And I and I I hit the guitar player on the arm or whatever. First night in Sheffield ever in the '80s. I said to the guitar player, same thing I said in Chicago. We opened for Cheap Trick, our first show of Bat Out of Hell, and I told him I'm not an opening act. We opened for Cheap Trick, and when we got, they booed and screamed up and gave us the finger and and telling us to get off stage and calling me a fat mf and all these things. My guitar player said, "We better go," and I turned around to him. I said. We're playing, we've been paid for 45 minutes, and we're playing 45 minutes, so get it together. And by the end of the, by the, end of the 45 minutes, they weren't booing, they weren't giving the finger, and when we finished, they went like this. They applauded. It wasn't like, yay, but it was an applause. So in 45 minutes, I took them from standing up screaming, booing, giving me the finger, to them sitting down going, well, that wasn't bad. <laughs> well, well, the clothes had been designed by Steinman. After that show, I said, "Okay, Jim, we're not. Nobody's wearing these clothes again." I, I can't remember. They were. I was craziness. I mean, he was trying to be theatrical and over the top, and you know, Kiss wore the makeup and all those costumes. But I said, "Jimmy, we, we're not that kind of group. We're not that band. We don't need that stuff. We don't need all the extra." pictures and curtain. We, we go out dress in normal clothes and we show them who we are. And everybody went, yeah, he's right. And so that's how we went after that first show. Except then I did it later on after an album, I think Bad Out of Hell 3 it was, and I dressed everybody up and after the, two, after the third show I went, oh my God, I did what Jim did in 77. Okay, get rid of all this stuff, we're done. We don't need this. We're not that kind of band. Let's go. I can't remember. And if you, I think if you watch the video, which we shot in Winnipeg, I think they're still in those costumes. <laughs> oh my! I think that's what I was going for, because I knew we were shooting a video, and they were making a, and also they were making a film about my life, um, and it was pretty good, except for every time I got off a sh stage, they go, "What do you think of the show?" I, it was horrible. It was terrible. And I go, don't you come into my dressing room. And nope, they wouldn't let anybody in my room. And I, I because I get a, every show I think sucks. Because there was one moment that it snapped me out of what I was doing and I had to get right back in it or, or something happened. I, I, I missed a note. I did, I could miss one note and the whole show was terrible. When I'm singing in the studio, I use a different voice than I do live. That's why people go, it doesn't sound like the record. No, because if I tried to sing in this voice live, my voice wouldn't last till the end of the song. 
And so you have to, my, the way my voice is, I either have to be like opera singer surrounded by eight mics and off of it, or I have to be really close and use this very, I don't know, really kind of pinched up voice. It's not all over, it's really focused. That's the way. I would do anything for love. I'd run right into hell and back. Oh, I would do anything for love. I'm never lie to you, and that's the fact. But I'll never forget the way you feel right now. Oh, no. No way, and I would do anything for love, but I won't do. Now that's not how I'd sing it live. I'd sing it live. And I would do anything for love. It would be loud and not that voice. Oh, you want that? Okay, we can do that. Anything for love. No, I would do anything for love. Oh, I would do anything for love. But I won't do that. Okay, now I want you to dare any singer to sing in the same key that he sang in 26 years ago. And then tell people, I heard me off singing, he didn't lose his voice. That's what they all write. He lost his voice. Well, excuse me, I fucked them. So anyway, um, that was the original key. And that's some high notes. Um, because, um, I've gone on hunts. I went on, uh, 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 TV show three times, um, go to haunted things. I chased a ghost into a room once and everybody goes, well, are you sure? And I went, yeah. And, and we sat in the room outside that doorway and the whole room and it dropped about three degrees, and over by me, where I was holding something, it dropped from, it was 74 in the room, and it dropped to 63, and like that. And um, I saw one in a, a hotel, in, uh, at the, um, in a hotel in London, where we stay all the time. It came, it was about six o'clock in the morning, it came across, and stopped and and looked and went on and I yelled at it and it never turned around, but it did stop and look at me, and I thought, whoa, and it, but it went before I could. It went right through the wall, so that meant there was a door here at one time, and I was my room, and p part of my room was in a hallway and went across the other side of my room was a doorway, because it used to be the train office and they made it into a hotel. Um, um, sorry, I need to do a song. U-N-T-I-N-G, song about a haunting. Dynamite by a band called Haunted. Ten hauntingly beautiful songs. And um, then there's a song called The Haunting. Come on in, boy. Set the scary 
And sitting by her closet door the Secrets and empty memories And broken hearts across the floor Floor with long hair of head They dragged me by my feet And a ghost where you buried me Wonder no one heard my scream Oh <laughs> okay. Enemy. <laughs> oh, then I got made up at Verdor's Light, which is not a haunting song at all. It goes. I don't know why they put this in there. I wrote the songs, the haunting songs. I remember every little thing, cause you damn know me yesterday. Mm, if I can buy the lake, and never not another car and say. And I never had a girl looking any better than you did. Sorry, Brian. Me and they do, they were wishing they were me that night. Okay. That's the original key. That's great. So just tell everybody that people are going, Milo can't sing anymore. Tell them, I heard sing Paradise for the Dashboard Light in the original key, so shove it. So let's do this, okay? See what we can do. Ready? This is for you. All right, this original key. I had one another key, but it was too low, and I didn't like. But a lonely boy looking for something new. Ooh. And you were nothing but a lonely girl, but you were something, something like a dream come. Time. Again, because I'm not warmed up. Okay, ready? I was nothing but a lonely boy looking for something new. <laughs> and you were nothing but a lonely girl, but you were something, something like a dream comes true. I am a varsity tackle and a hell of a block. We let me my guitar, I mean you can't, you're the rock, but... Every Saturday night, I felt the fever grow. You know what it's like, all revved up and no place to go. All revved up and no place to go. So now, um, yeah, I, I, I cracked a little bit, so I had to do it over. Uh, you're in quarantine. We're all in quarantine, so I sing that. Because you're all ripped up with no place to go, aren't you? What's in my throat? It's the pollen. And, and there's so many friggin' trees here. It's ridiculous. Listen, I kind of disappeared off the, off the page there. Because starting in we started trying to do a new album in late 2015 after we came off the road in uh, early 2015, and we started getting all the songs together and what did we get from Jimmy and and we started trying to record. We got a house out in California, started trying to record, and I fell. I fell off the stairs. And onto the floor, I fell over the railing up at the top, uh, talking to somebody, just fell off and landed. I didn't get hurt, just missed getting hurt when I fell 
down the stairs, and but I slipped and fell in the shower, and it had a ridge, you know, a tile ridge like that, and I fell right in the my, right on my back in the middle of my back on the lower part of my back actually, but the middle of my body, right on that spot. My guitar player had to run upstairs and help me get up, and and it didn't feel like it hurt it then, but it did. So I had one surgery, and I went back and I recouped and and PT'd and got ready and went and did a series with Vincent Opera in Vancouver. But something happened. I went to my acting coach first for a couple of weeks and then went. But as I was working with the acting coach, my back started to feel funny. It felt great when I got there. And so I went to the doctor and MRI said, I don't see anything. Went up there and it was a 13 show series, guaranteed 13. But as we were working, my back got so bad they took me out of three episodes, which was a drag. I kept going, don't do that. I can work. I said, you just got to change the scene. I can't go up on the roof. And they go, well, we're going to give it to somebody else. We're just going to let you rest. I go, don't do that. Anyway, save the money. And I did 10. And um, it's called Ghost Wars. And I knew after the first two that we were only going to do 13 because... And in the first one, I had this little little tiny scene with this actor, and I didn't write, I did a movie with him. I, go, I felt so stupid. Well, I didn't even know it until I saw the first episode on TV. I'm going, I know him. Yeah, I did that movie with him. Well, I don't know. I guess my character, I was so in character, and I hadn't seen him before that, and I only saw him in character. My character didn't recognize him. Well, I only recognized him as a townsman, and because I was sheriff. So anyway, that's some stupid story. The last surgery was seven hours, and I should have done the Tiger Woods surgery. They went, and Tiger Woods still playing golf. He's not as good as he used to be, but he's still damn good. Trust me. Um, they went in through his stomach. And the reason is, is because when they go down your back, all your back muscles and your nerves get all, but your stomach muscles, I read you can rebuild those much easier than you can rebuild your back. So they did went into his stomach, moved his stomach, obviously. And so I got to his spine, replaced disc, sewed him back up. Yes, he had nerve damage in here, but it's much easier to recover that um, than it is your back. And he's out playing golf because he can swing. If they're going through his back, he would never be able to swing a golf club again. And I should have done that. It would have been much better for me. Well, I remember every little thing that happened only yesterday. Parking by the lake and now I'm not another car and said, And I never had a girl looking any better than you did. And all the kids at school, they were wishing they were me that night. Now our bodies are all so close and tight. It never felt so good, it never felt so right. And we're glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife. Glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife. Come on. Okay, God, I can't believe I sing that much. I sing, I'm a little raspy too. And I would do anything for love. I'd run right into hell and back. Pow, pow. I would do anything for love. Oh, I would do anything for love. Oh, I would do anything for love. But I won't do that. No, I won't do. Ba -da -da -da. Um, some days it don't come easy. Some days it don't come hard. Anyway, so I'm too raspy to do this right now. Okay? So that was okay. It wasn't great, but it was okay. <laughs> 